of my dearest friends and a man I have enormous respect for. This is a gentleman who is a marketing legend. In fact, he wanted to work with every different type of industry possible and see if he couldn't find unrealized you know, opportunities for these organizations, revenue opportunities. And what he did best was, by working with so many different organizations, he saw that if you compete with other people and you do the same thing they're doing and you do it better, you have a tiny competitive advantage. But if you do something no one else is doing, you have an extraordinary competitive advantage. And over the years, and literally decades for him, he's refined that philosophy and he's the go-to guy now. And I gotta say, there's, if you think of most of the marketing consultants that you probably don't know the name of, they've all been influenced by Jay, including myself. I look at him as somebody that I look as a dear friend, but I also look at somebody who's a mentor to anybody in business. I think he's the premier man when it comes to figuring out how do you take unrealized opportunities? How do you maximize? Because I do a lot of things in my life and I pride myself on my skill in this area, but this is all he's done for decade after decade after decade after decade, and he's always getting better. So it's a great privilege to bring out, and I'd like to give me a giant welcome to Mr. Jay Abraham, my dear friend. Give a hand. Jay Abraham, a marketing legend, mentor Jay to mentors, Abraham, and, and the gentlemen. highest paid marketing consultant in the world. Hey everyone, welcome. I'm so excited because today I have the man, the living legend, Mr. Jay Abraham. Jay, thank you so much for coming on this show. Oh, my I pleasure. Thank you for in. It's a privilege and a pleasure always to contribute to uh, people that are trying to help entrepreneurs uh, be better and grow. Absolutely. And so I want to first start off with a uh, huge gratitude. And probably about 10 years ago, when I was kind of coming up and I was, you know, pretty broke, um, learning about internet marketing, I came across a guy called Joe Polish and Dean Jackson. And I started listening to your interviews. And I remember going to a Tony Robbins event and um, he had given this audio out, which basically you talked about how to, you know, how to tap into other people's customer list doing joint ventures. And I want to say like you've had a huge impact on my life. I was able to go from zero to more than $30 million in sales for my own business. Because That's wonderful. Before the age of 30. Yeah. Well, I'm excited, Jay. I have a bunch of questions. So I'm going to get straight into Ask it. Ask away. Um, one of the things that's been very fascinating to watch and to see and to experience and learn from yourself is this just crazy ability to dissect a problem in so many different ways. How does someone develop that thinking? Where does that thinking come from? Uh, it's 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 not as hard as you think, uh, Shaq, but it's it requires a commitment. I became an accidental master at that by being involved in a multitude of different industries when I was young and I made a realization after about 10 totally different industries I was involved in that people in one industry do not have a clue how people in another think, how they market their strategies, their business models, their access vehicles. And I realized after 10 of them that you could literally take elements from other industries combine them together into hybrids, apply them into industries where everyone else in the industry does the same thing the same way to possess what I will call hopeless curiosity in terms of I want to know everything I can about everything I can from everyone I can meet. I do not discriminate. I want to see not just how your business or industry operates, how you market, what your philosophies, your strategy, your business model. I want to know your belief systems, you know, uh, you know, what your realities are, because I want to understand not just marketing methodology, but how to understand the differences in human beings, because you are, you are trying to own mind share ethically of human beings. You're trying to motivate human beings who are your team members you're trying to uh, attract uh, entrepreneurial human beings who are your promotional partners. You're trying to get uh, human beings who are your support teams, your agencies, your marketing uh, advisors and experts to give more of their ability to you than anyone else. So the more you understand all the different dynamics that could come together to create superior impact, advantage, 
uh, connectivity. So I just try always to learn everything I can. I have, for example, uh, a team that goes to the LinkedIn every week and contacts interesting people from all kinds of different environments just so I can talk to them, no agenda, because I want to learn what they know that I don't. And I want to share what I know that they don't and do an exchange, but I'm just constantly doing that. People can do that. Now, that's what I do. How they can do it to answer your question is commit themselves every day or at least every week to travel outside their comfort zone. Easiest way to start, given COVID and everything, is to go online and visit websites, platforms, uh, uh, discussion groups, uh, study what's going on in any industry, any field, any topic other than what you usually study. And as you're experiencing that, ask yourself, what is there about what I am experiencing that is foreign normally to me that I could adapt or adopt to my business or my career or my life? And after you start doing that on an ongoing basis, you start opening up. The next thing is to master Socratic interviewing, the ability to ask others to open up about themselves and be tremendously interested in them and ask meaningful questions. And if you do that with constant focus on improving, you'll become able in the course of a half hour discussion or an hour to distill ethically the key elements of what drives their business if they're an entrepreneur, what drives their their uh, their job uh, category if they're an employee, what jo- drives their mindset if they uh, have any kind of hobby or ideological interest outside of it. And as you keep adding that, your subconscious compounds, I can go on and on, but there's a quick answer. I appreciate that very much. Um, in terms of, uh, and I have a whole list, so I'm going to just... Yeah, go for it. I'm going to go through, um, in terms of like right now, so for example, thinking in a, in a in a way that you are not just thinking one way, but going to outside different industries, getting different perspectives, then leading into let's just say an individual's business. Like right now, uh, like before this interview, you asked me about this award, right? And I was explaining um, the award was for you know basically making a bunch of sales, um, and in this industry, which is which involves, for example, sales funnels. So now this is a this is like a, a new thing. But it's been around for decades and decades. It's just the new term is sales funnels uh, or sales processes or whatever. And so now it's becoming yes. everyone is getting into it. And so when everyone gets into an industry, obviously, because there's a lot of money, right? Like um, in in an industry, like, for example, the I army, mean, you know, there's a lot of money in this whole concept of sales funnels. There are people that charge $10,000 to $100,000 to 250 k to build these sales processes out. And as it's becoming bigger and bigger, there's another company coming. There's, it's becoming a red bloody ocean. If you were to advise someone to becoming a, you know, an authority in a marketplace like this, what would your advice be? Well, well I mean, the, the, the biggest problem with most authorities is they don't really try to appreciate their client's client. The more you understand your client's client, because you're the advocate of the client. It's a client, not the client. I mean, you may be the one paying me, but you're really paying for you're paying me to be masterful and being able to understand the mind, the hopes, the dreams, desires, motives, motivations of your target client. I think most professionals or most service people do not really try to understand masterfully the client's client. I never saw my role being the client, although they paid me ultimately. I saw my role being the advocate of the client's client. And I think it's a very big chat. Look, I certainly understand, you know, until very early in my life, your goal in interaction with anyone and your goal in assessing anything you're going to do with any human being 
is to try to examine, evaluate, understand, appreciate, uh, 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 acknowledge, respect, and recognize and play back that you do all those things to people for whatever their realities are and understand that there are many, many realities going on right now. Many people who do funnels, many people who do uh, info marketing, they, they default to hyperbolic copy that I would call, uh, uni it's universal. It's the same buzzwords and the same bullets and the same hype and the same, uh, you know, you could, you could, you know, spin around and pick any one and it says the same. If you want to own Mindshare and not be manipulative, you, you will appreciate and respect the human beings, on the individual human beings on the other end of the communication and you'll work backwards and you will gain what we call a love for that person, a respect and admiration for what that person is trying to either get closer to or away from to achieve and why. And you won't just look at superficiality. You'll look at him and her, her as a, a husband, a wife, a father, a mother, somebody who's got hopes and dreams. And you'll appreciate them in the fullest sense for their, uh, their value as a human being. And I don't think most people do that. It may be a little, little abstract, and a little uh, sophisticated, what I just said, but it's very powerful. Yeah, I um, I remember going to a Tony's event. I've been a fan of Tony and, and Rich Sheffern for many years. Um, and uh, Tony said the same thing that you taught him. He said he was in love with his products and he would be basically like, he'd be chasing the next product. And he said, it was until I met a man called Jay Abraham that said, fall in love with the people and my market versus the products so thanks a lot for that in uh, thank you yeah that was um, it's a very powerful distinction if you as an entrepreneur watching listening however you disseminate this if you can grasp the magnitude of that distinction and you can harness it authentically meaning you can't you can't achieve greatness by faking it it has to be a natural excuse me a natural part of your being. But if you can really do this, you'll be able, I mean, whoever creates the funnels, you'll be either able to guide them or craft them yourself from an appreciation, an, a genuine appreciation of that target audience, not just the sense that they're a source of making money, but you'll see them much more humanistic. You'll see them as somebody that you have the chance to be a catalyst to transform a, a, a stage or a progression or a phase of their life. And you'll look at your role with much more uh, responsibility and, and, um, and sincerity, and you'll take it very seriously. Yeah, which leads me to this concept that you, you've always taught, which is a uh, strategy of preeminence. Yes, uh, sir. Could you briefly like describe that and why it's, it's critical for business owners to implement that? I, I will be happy to, but I need to disclaim that to do it justice takes about three hours. But the essence of uh, the strategy for eminence is really simple. You want to be seen no matter what you do in business or career as the most trusted advisor, the, uh, the only viable choice, the go-to source for whatever it is you stand for as a company, as a individual, as a, uh, as a employee, in order to do that, you have to be willing to have a very well reasoned perspective that you share with the other side, those people you interact with that is meaningful and different than what they hear from everyone else, but it has to be authentic. You have to be able to put into words at a better, higher, clear, crisper, more resonant level what people are feeling that they've never expressed before so that it, you penetrate to their subconscious and their subconscious actually says to them, this man or woman or company or product understands me and serves me better and 
satisfies what I'm trying to get to and understands how to explain it in ways I didn't even uh, know myself. Next, you have to be able to not allow people. You have to care enough about their well-being that you don't let them buy less than they should or more than they should in less quantity, quality, combinations, or frequency than they should, not because you will be the loser, but because they will be not getting the fullest outcome or they will get too much outcome and don't need it. Conversely, if you believe that your company provides greater uh, performance, protection, profitability, uh, support, you have to go out of your way not to let them buy from your competitors or not buy nothing because it's going to deserve them, not because the competitors is a shit. Next, you can't, uh, you, you, you have to do what you said. You stop focusing on, excuse me, somebody is upstairs and just dropped something. I'm in a basement, a wine cellar. You cannot uh, fall in love with your industry or just making money or being the fastest growing company. You fall in love with those people you serve, your clients. And if you want to be the most trusted advisor, you refer to people you deal with as clients, not as customers. And the reason is if you look at Webster's dictionary definition of a customer, I guess you would use Webster's or maybe Oxford, is somebody who's buying a, a customer, somebody who buys a commodity and a service. If you call me a customer, what you're saying between the lines is that you are no better than everybody else. There's nothing distinctive, nothing superior, no benefit other than just maybe convenience or the luck of the draw to deal from you. A client is someone who's under the care, the protection, the well-being of another. It's got a fiduciary role. Next, you want to communicate in terms that use a lot of metaphors, similes, um, case studies, analogies, because that's how the mind easiest relates. Anybody watching who has been raised with any religion, doesn't matter your religious beliefs, parables are the way they make their point, storytelling. And storytelling is much more powerful than declared statements. It's much more powerful than graphs and charts. Uh, it's it's just the, the most powerful way to do it. Uh, also, you have to be on a crusade or a mission and see yourself as a champion, an advocate of uh, of of a market that is being disserved, a market that. Uh, you can add unique value to a market that has gaps that you can fill. Those are the basic. I can go on and on. Yeah, um, which leads me to this because um, you did a, a live a little while ago with Roland Frazier and, and you, you were talking about, especially when COVID hit, right? You were basically talking about uh, the power of uh, pivoting and uh, basically profiting because there's going to be a lot of opportunity. Because you have seen so many different recessions you know, what is your advice to someone um, who is, you know, who's like, who's an entrepreneur, like to, even to me, basically, yes. uh, that you would say, hey, you know what, I've got decades of ex expertise and experience when it comes to recession. These are the things that you should avoid. These are the things that you should focus on. What would be like your one to three things that you would advise on? Uh, well, there's, there's about six or seven that I've been talking about in other interviews. So I ought to share them with you so that if you have entrepreneurs that are looking for uh, a greater windows of opportunity, they can see what some of them are. First of all, if you have a business, solidify your relationship with all your client base. Second is expand your product service offering to products and services people buy, excuse me, before, during, after, even instead of buying your product because it could double or triple the profitability you get out of them. Third, is if you have a lot of, if you sell one or, or limited products and people are inactive buyers and you have trust and credibility with them, figure other ways you could monetize the relationship by introducing them to other product services they logically buy because of what you know about them that you can recommend at profit from. Uh, next is there's five activities that are very huge opportunities that are uh, open right now and are closing relatively rapidly, but they tie directly to uh, what's happening with COVID. And in, in each one of these opportunities, you can actually be a benefactor. You're not 
taking advantage. The first one is that there's more companies, entities, organizations, media sources, um, and associations out there and influencers who are open today to doing deals, partnerships, joint ventures, endorsements, co-branding, uh, letting you sell your product through them, selling their product through you, things that wouldn't have been possible before of this because everyone is hurting financially and everyone's unsure and everyone's looking for greater cash flow and advantage. So you can make deals that you could never do and do partnerships you can never do and joint ventures. Second, there are many, many companies that are very, very, very basically surviving and they're probably going to uh, go under unless saviors like you, meaning your audience, identifies them and realizes that if you acquire either the business or easier, just the assets, the databases, the marketing pieces, the intellectual property, the URL, the phone number, they have salespeople uh, or, or affiliates, and you consolidate it into your business where you already have overhead and and, and uh, an infrastructure, you can eliminate a lot of the overhead that other company is is stuck with and you could pay the owner of it a share of the profits you're able to create by reducing overhead and they can make more from doing nothing by letting you take over either their business or their assets. And that's a big opportunity and you're also doing well because a lot of these people are going to lose everything if somebody doesn't intervene. The next area, which is really cool and most people don't understand this, there have been an enormous number of people who have been put out of jobs. Uh, some have been hired back, but a lot of them are still unemployed. There's two categories, low skilled and super skilled. Low skilled, I have great empathy for. They're very wonderful men, women, husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, and they're struggling. And I feel great compassion, but they're not relevant to what I'm about to say. The super skilled are people that before they lost their job, they had roles where they were interacting with key decision makers all over different industries, companies, roles, you know, CEOs, entrepreneurs, professionals, CI, CTOs, you know, CIOs, all these things, CMOs. And now and they lost their job because of one of three things, either the company consolidated roles and they were duplicated, or extraneous, or younger, or less uh, seniority, their uh, their role was no longer uh, doable at that level because the the, the role became either uh, uh, extraneous or the market uh, dried up a bit. And worse is they were just paying; they were earning too much, and they wanted and the employer wanted to get them off of payroll. Most people don't understand that these people can be identified on LinkedIn and other sources like that. They are sitting around dying a dismal financial death because they were used to making six figures and now they're on unemployment and making uh, pittance and worried that they'll get job offers if they get any that'll be way under what they're used to and they're running out of money or they are very run out and they may lose their houses and it's a very, very horrible time, but if you can find them and convince them of the value of your company, your product, your service, you can get them to introduce you to some of these relationships that you could never gain access to in a million years on your own and get instant access and just give these people shares of any revenue that comes and you could just have a, a, a windfall, you know, super colossal grand slam home run. The next area of opportunity are salespeople. I mean, uh, amongst the 30 or so million people in the United States that are out of work still, I think probably 10, 15 percent are salespeople, people who lost their job because the company consolidated, and didn't need all those salespeople or whatever they were selling became less uh, in demand. And these people are used to making a lot of money on performance and they're sitting around. You can find them again on and they can find specialized ones or generalized ones. You can find them on LinkedIn and you can do three things with them. You can have them basically work for you to fill, to find those other three categories I just talked about. Or you can have them do deals for you on commission, or if they earn 
uh, the right through performance, hire them. So you got all those uh, and they can give you enormous ability that you don't normally have access to and you can move them to variable, to performance, to commission, to revenue share, profit share, so much of the deal. The next thing and the last is what I call option trading, Shaq, but it's not securities, it's getting the rights to access or assets and then flipping them. The easiest way to explain it is me telling you two simple stories. Uh, 30 years ago, uh, a colleague of mine that I had worked with in Santa Barbara, California, quit his management job and moved to Los Angeles. He wanted to be an entrepreneur, but he had a very brilliant strategy. He looked for something he could get control of and then flip to somebody else to do all the heavy lifting and the work. What he found was, uh, you probably know there what our Rose Bowl is, the football game. Are you familiar with that? Oh. Every year in the United States, January sometime, there's a big football game between the winning college uh, teams and it's called the Rose Bowl because there is a uh, there is a stadium in Los Angeles called the Rose Bowl. It's where this football game is held and it also is where our university UCLA plays their football games and that and that uh, stadium is also used occasionally for concerts. But other than that, it's not used at all. This man that wanted to find a deal, identified the Rose Bowl as being underutilized. It was it is owned by the county of Los Angeles. He went there and negotiated with them the rights to use it on the days it was not being utilized for football or concerts and do flea markets. He worked out a deal where he paid a royalty, I mean a percentage of the revenue he would bring in and it was renewable if he gave them a certain amount of revenue and had no real, uh, you know, uh, uh, conduct problems over a, a contract period. He did not know anything about flea markets, but with that agreement in hand, and the agreement had the right for him to bring in partners, he found the number one company in the country who managed flea markets. He went to them, he took his agreement, he got them to pay him $500,000 up front plus a share of all the revenue. And he made millions of dollars for doing nothing but seeing and flipping the opportunity. And there's tons of those out there. Brands, distribution, sales forces, uh, being a back end for somebody, using somebody's uh, 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 distributors, retailers differently, all kinds of things you could do. I, mean, I have a whole program on it. We used to teach it all over the world. But uh, those are a couple of ideas and there's lots more, but that should get your people thinking. That is, um, for a couple of, uh, got, got a few more questions. One is um, when you look at a business that's doing say seven to eight figures, um, you know, a million to $10 million and, and they go ambitions and hopes to get to a hundred million dollars. What would you say are the critical drivers that, 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 that people miss? Um, is it the team? Is it cash? Yeah. Strategy? yeah. Well, I mean, if, if you followed my work, and not, not that you have to, but if you follow my work, anybody, I have uh, so many different distinctions, but I, I spent a lot of time trying to identify high leverage. But my whole point is everything in, in our lives are the result of levers that we depend on, screwdrivers, pop-top caps, window cranks, shovels, brooms. Uh, car jacks, but we don't understand how to use levers in our business. Everything is a lever. And I've done lots of different categories of levers. I just never called it that. But there's nine levers that we call the nine drivers of exponential growth. And and we also have 15 or, or 16 pivot points. But the nine drivers are elements in a business that as you shift them, your performance multiplies potentially geometric for each one, but your risk and your investment is almost, uh, 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 it's, it's almost zero additional. Change your strategy, you change your results. Change your business model, you change your results. Change your marketing, and there's 
eight or 10 ways you can do that. You change your results. You change how you use capital, human capital, uh, intellectual capital, uh, and change your results. You change how you uh, monetize relationships, internal, external, you change your results. You change how you use processes, procedures, uh, you change your results and, and uh, methodology and, uh, and uh, uh, well, there's another word and I can't think of it, but I got about nine of these, but most people don't really think about that. What I would do if I were working with a client privately, Shaq, and this might help, I divide the relationship into two very unique activities. One is what we call maximizing and then multiplying. So any business that is profitable right now is doing something that is working. It is not likely that they are optimizing whatever they're doing because most people don't even know how many higher, better performing ways they can take, uh, you know, all kinds of elements in a business on the revenue side. But let's assume they're making money. So the first thing I do is look at all the things that are going on within that business. Ad, sales approach, lead generation, conversion, how they monetize what they do at the sale, before the sale, after the sale, uh, with people that don't buy right now, how they use their marketing, their advertising, their conversion, their lead generating approach. I look at quantification, how different kinds of buyers, sources of buyers, uh, product service type buyers convert, what their lifetime differential values are. Then when I get all that down, I start systematically making everything they're doing and everyone they're currently doing it with and how they are doing it and where they are doing it perform better because that costs no more money. It just gets a lot more financial yield. So it brings in windfall profits that are not uh, critical to the operation of the business because theoretically the business has been profitable without this in improvement, without this enhancement. So you can take all that newfound money and use it to fund what we call the multiplying activities, the new activities, the new marketing fields, the new, the new profit centers, the new markets you penetrate, the new selling approaches you bring, the new products or services you create. And that's a very systematic process. But those are only a few of the things. But I mean, if nobody thinks about that, that's a good start. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's got me thinking a lot. Um, in terms of, this is like more of a personal question for you. Um, the, the, this is something that I got from uh, Dan Sullivan from Strategic Coach, right? And he talks about Every, you know, five years or 25 years, you find something that really fascinates and motivates you, that carries you on for the next, you know, 10, 25 years. What yes. What that fascinates and motivates you right now? Uh, I have about three different uh, categories or, or answers. One is I'm obsessed with uh, a constant discovery at a more elevated level than I probably was earlier in my life because I understand a lot more and I'm probably more interested in more complex things. Second, I have uh, lived a life of uh, high contribution, but not really been focused on huge wealth creation because uh, I was more interested in doing lots of things with lots of different companies. And as I've gotten older, I'm more interested now in building assets that will transcend me. So we're building out a consulting business. We're getting, we're doing more collaborative work with decent companies where I get a long-term profit participation that gets converted into equity if they ever sell it. Uh, things that are more high upside leveraged where I can, you know, I can uh, do something once, get paid for it ongoing, where I can leverage my skill set and get uh, a lot more. I mean, right now we've been very blessed. I can, and this is not being arrogant, but we get $15,000 an hour if I consult, but it's finite. Whereas if I can give you a concept that makes your business perform 40% better, and that's an extra 
$2 million a year in gross profit and I get a quarter of it instead of getting, you know, uh, you know, a hundred thousand dollars for time, I would get a million dollars or half a million dollars for the value of the concept and I would keep getting it. So I'm moving a lot to that. Uh, I like con contribution. If this interaction, we're having this conversation has the ability to shift the direction and the elevation and the acceleration of qualitative and deserving entrepreneurs uh, success. It gives me uh, a, a lot of fulfillment for five years. We didn't even try to get to, to capture opt-ins and we didn't sell anything. We just gave away better resources than anybody else. And I thought that was really a cool thing to do. It turns out I lost a million dollars a year doing it and we didn't sell anything in my and my team got mad at me, but I've been a benefactor and a contributor to entrepreneurship all my life. We give away better stuff on our website than most people sell. I, you know, I don't, you know, I, I only deal, I mean, sort of Robin Hoodie. We don't want to make money from people who can't afford it. So we just give them stuff. And uh, what else? Uh, and I like, I like uh, doing good. I think everybody should, there's a, there's a belief system that I was introduced to many years ago, and it's quite profound in its simplicity. It's very, very simple, Shaq. Anytime you interact for, with anybody for any reason, in any way, outside the business, inside the business, on the street, in any kind of social or fraternal or, or, or any kind, of, your, 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 your job is to make their life better off because you were in it even if it's for a fleeting moment, if you smile at them, if you listen to them, if you uh, pay attention, if you do something nice with or for them, if you share something, I mean, those little things make a profound difference. And I think uh, a lot of young people have been ill-advised to pursue money for money's sake and not to really appreciate uh you know, the, the, the uh, humanistic side of our lives and not appreciate the, the value of the people they're dealing with and to see that money should be the reward for creating value for others, not just something that you, you pursue for pure monetary sake. It should be the, the, the byproduct of saying, how can I make meaningful difference you either add value, protect, enrich, entertain, whatever your product service company is designed to do. How can I do that in such a way that the value I create, excuse me, the value I create is rewarding back to me because enough people appreciate it. And that's sort of what I think most people don't always understand about the purpose of business. You're really here to make a difference in people's lives. And if your product or service and company doesn't do that, you have to either realign yourself or you're never going to be as successful as you could be if you were focused on being a value creator, uh, you know, a, a generator of greater advantage for your marketplace. Wow. Deep. <laughs> it is deep. It is very deep. And it might be too deep for a lot of people. I mean, I, when I when I speak, if I go to mixed audiences where you have an arc of very serious entrepreneurs and you know and uh, uh, startup, uh, particularly ones that are trying to sell things online, the real ones love this. The little ones who really don't understand, they'll never get to any place great. They think it's boring because they want to know what, give me a tactic. Tell me the next funnel or tell me the next, the next uh, launch concept or tell me the next Facebook uh, ad generation or tell me how to, you know, how to make uh, YouTube pay off. And they don't understand that that's only a static advantage. The people selling that, and I know a lot of them and they're fine people, but they're not trying to sell you alone that they're trying to sell a hundred thousand or a million of you that so in the beginning if you get a tactic ahead of everybody you have a short window of opportunity 
but sooner or later, everybody has it. And then at first it becomes a standard everyone has to do just to be, you know, competitive, but then it becomes antiquated and you got to find a new tactic and a new tactic. And you can never win that way. I don't think you, most people don't understand integrative, strategic, uh, ongoing, sustaining business building because they're, they're not looking at it as a business. They're looking at it as an extended promotion that sooner or later will burn out unless they try to understand the real rules of sustaining entrepreneurship. Yeah. You know, um, all, that has, I remember when I first started listening to you, Jay, and it was, the, um, these audios, they, they were so old, they were so old, but it was all I could get my hands on. Um, and you didn't have 50 shades of Jay, or you didn't have the free materials back like 10 years ago. I mean, you did, but it wasn't what I accessed. And one of the things, um, I remember very clearly learning was focusing on principles versus tactics. There was a guy, I don't know if you know him, called Andre Chaperon, and he talked about, Andre Chaperon uh, created this, he's like one of Rich Chaperon's friends, but he created this program called Autoresponder Madness, right? Like how to write emails. And he was yes. super influenced by your work. And he talked about this concept of like, most people are chasing tactics and he called them Frank uh, versus Matt. And Matt was the person that was focused on boring principles. And one of the things I want to do, I always do now, and, and I've done for, I'd, I'd say for the last 10 years, is I'd rather have boring businesses that are built on long-term principles versus short-term tactics. So that has, that has impacted me a lot. That's great. No, no. And thank you for that. You're very impressive and I'm, I'm grateful. Yeah. I mean, I've spent a lot of years trying to help people uh, transform themselves into true entrepreneurs instead of just short-term uh, income generators. It's a very big difference. And it, it, and, and it has to do with creating experiences and value in a different way. And it's a thrill when you can do that. You see somebody grasp it like yourself and the people you're talking about. It's heartbreaking when people think that a superficial short-term agenda is going to really bring them sustained uh, success, prosperity, or satisfaction and fulfillment because it can't and it won't. Jay, what do you want your legacy to be, you know, once you've kind of, you know, left the That's world? a great question. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's interesting. And a lot of people don't understand this. I mean, I have, geez, my body of work is, it's huge. We have probably 30, 40 different seminars we've done. We have tens of thousands of pages of, of uh, written material. We have... I don't know, 40 different concepts or principles that I'm known for. But really and truly, none of that is very valuable if you don't keep promoting it. And I don't really do a lot anymore to promote it. I would say that I would hope that people recognize that I have challenged business owners and professionals to be true entrepreneurs in the very literal, literal word creators of value, making a difference in people's lives, doing something beyond their competition, making their audience better off because they and their product or service and team members were in it, helping the, the their market, but also creating environments for their team members to grow, develop, and prosper. And, and I'd like to hope that with the rewards that these entrepreneurs receive, the money they make, they are just by, and I've been guilty in my earlier stages of not doing what I'm saying. I hope they don't just buy Ferraris and, you know, and big houses and jewelry and, and stuff. I hope that they invest it meaningfully back in valuable things for themselves, first of all, so that they will have security, but reinvest in their community reinvest in their marketplace, reinvest in, in other people they can help. If people like myself take the time to invest in them, you would like to see the same. One of the things I'll tell you, it's one of my laments. We have this very, we have a great uh, podcast we don't promote, 
We have an email list that I don't really promote, but every time we give very, very unique uh, resources gratis. And I watch and see how many people re-gift and, and share it with people. And people are selfish. They don't take the time to help others. They're so self-consumed by and large that they don't give back. And I think that one of my legacies would be that people see that they have a moral responsibility and obligation and a privilege to help others be better too, to help others grow more, add more, create more. And I think if I can have left the world with that awareness, it'd be pretty cool. Wow, uh, that is uh, incredible. Jay, I want to respect your time. Um, and so I want to wrap this up for, uh, is there, if there's one, like one last thing that you'd want to say to any entrepreneurs who are like, well, listening to this, um, what is that message that you want to give them? Uh, it's a pretty cool message, and it's a quote by someone, and uh, it's one that I used to use all the time, and I stopped, but it's really cool. Once you realize how much more you can get, give, achieve from time, effort, opportunity, capital, market access, interaction, uh, human capital, intellectual capital, you will shift or you should shift uh, a a uh, gnawing question that torments most people. Most people who are entrepreneurs struggle all the time with a non-verbalized question. The question they struggle with is, Am I worthy of this of this goal? I mean, can I really make a half a million dollars? Can I really keep this information marketing or this service organization or this product or this Amazon sales organization keep growing and growing and paying an income or get me to where it could be full time? Can I use it to you know to acquire the lifestyle I want? When you figure out how much more you could achieve from time, effort, opportunity, you know, marketing, markets, the right question is not, am I worthy of this goal? It's the opposite. Is this goal worthy of me? Because you're probably setting far too low of a site, far too low of aspiration, far too low of a goal of impact contribution. And I would challenge everybody to rethink their whole business reality. I appreciate that very much, uh, Jay. This is for entrepreneurs, but I feel like this this conversation is just for me. Uh, so thank you. I I super super appreciate it. Uh, God bless you. Um, I want to say, guys, if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you subscribe and uh, leave us a comment below. If you aren't subscribed, make sure you go to Abraham.com. That's the best resource, right? Abraham.com. Yeah. Make sure you subscribe. Subscribe to the Ultimate Entrepreneur Podcast. Uh, join the list. There's tons and tons and tons of free information that Jay gives with his team. So make sure you go to abraham.com and you register, you sign up. If you're listening to this on the podcast, leave us a review on the podcast. Again, make sure you go to abraham.com and sign up for the list. So thank you again so much. I really appreciate your time. And um, just all of the experience, expertise, wisdom, and decades and decades of just value that you've that you've just given um like truly you you've you've made a huge huge impact i'm sure you know but in my life especially and um... that's great it's great and and do me a favor please send uh brian the uh the file because we usually take anything that i think uh has merit and we'll put it out on our uh on our site and we'll put it sometimes even as a podcast and and uh, link and refer back to you. And I think this had some good content that might have usability other places. So it's our pleasure to use it other ways for you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Jay. My pleasure. Bye. What's the stage for two?